Good, good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining the Pre-Columbian Society of Washington, D.C.'s monthly lecture for December. Uh, my name is Kevin Kelly. I'm the president of the Pre-Columbian Society, in case you haven't seen me before. Uh, if you're not familiar with the Society, I want to direct you to our website, www.pcswdc.org. And you can find out information about our lectures at our annual symposium and other information as well. <clears throat> I wanna draw your attention to the bottom of your screen. You'll see a Q and A tab down there. Please use that to enter your questions during tonight's lecture, because I'll be referring to that to uh, read the questions to our speaker at the end. Don't put them in the chat <clears throat> uh, button if you can't avoid that. Put in Q and A, it makes it a little easier. You just go to one place instead of toggling back and forth between both places there. Um, okay, with that, I'm going to go ahead and introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Carolyn Boyd, Texas State University in San Marcos, Texas. She'll be talking to us tonight about soul expressions, speech and breath in archaic period rock art. So at this point, I'll turn it over to Dr. Boyd. Thank you so much. Uh, it's wonderful to be here. I'm been looking forward to this uh, for some time. I'll be sharing something that is really near and dear to my heart. Uh, just have enjoyed this area of research so much. Um, so let's just dive right on in. So in Houston and Talby's seminal article in Archaeology of the Senses, they wrote that the sensations of the past um, cannot be retrieved, only their encoding and imperishable media this evening, I'll show how speech and breath and song and smell were encoded in the rock art produced 5,000 years ago within the canyons of Southwest Texas and Northern Mexico, thousands of years prior to the earliest known graphic expressions of uh, speech breath in the Americas. I'd like to start just by thanking you uh, for inviting me to be here. Uh, it's, as I said, it's a pleasure and to acknowledge too the support that I've received from National Geographic Society, the National Endowment for Humanities and National Science Foundation that have been uh, really key to a lot of the work that you're gonna be hearing about tonight. Much of what I'll be discussing is included in an article that um, I recently published with Ashley Busby in Latin American Antiquity. Uh, the article, Speech Breath, Mapping the Multisensory Experience in Pecos River Style Pictography is open access. So if you're interested, you can find it by Googling it. I'll begin the presentation with just a brief introduction to the Lower Pecos Canyon lands uh, and to the Pecos River rock art. This will be followed by a discussion on how we documented and analyzed the speech breath motif and then I'll dive into the meaty stuff, looking at the resulting patterns and potential functions and meanings of the motif. The Lower Pecos Canyon lands are situated along the U.S.-Mexico border, and although the, the boundaries are really ill-defined, the visual and material culture that characterize the region extend about 70 miles north of the border and 90 miles south of the border. Due to security issues, we've not been able to document the art in Coahuila, Mexico, uh, but we hope to be launching um, a full baseline document documentation project soon. Um, three major waterways, the Rio Grande, the Pecos, and the Devils River run through the region. See the Pecos here, the Devils, and the Rio Grande. And these rivers have provided a permanent water source through the millennia and have sliced through the limestone to create deep canyons, many of which are filled with hundreds of rock shelters, some of which are enormous. You can get a sense of the scale here. Can you see the people down here at the base? They're walking up to get into the shelter here. That is one heck of a climb, I can promise you. These rock shelters contain some of the best preserved and longest records of hunting and gathering lifeways in North America from about 13,000 years ago to European contact. As a result, it's considered one of the most significant archeological regions in the world. 
above the archaeological deposits and painted along the rock sheltered walls and cliff overhangs lies a rich record of highly complex polychromatic mural art. This art tradition that we refer to as Pecos River style is the defining archeological phenomenon of the Lower Pecos. More than 200 shelters uh, north and likely as many south of the border contain Pecos River style imagery. Because the paint contains organic components, we've been able to radiocarbon date the murals. A chemist, Dr. Karen Steelman at Shumla, uses plasma oxidation to extract organic paint or organic carbon from the paint samples and sends those off for AMS radiocarbon dating. Over the past few years, we've obtained 28 radiocarbon dates across eight sites. These dates range in age from between 3640 BC to AD 655. In other words, Pegasus River style was in production for over 3000 years. Jaguar Shelter, which you see pictured here, is the oldest dated site in the region, coming in at 5580 to 5320 Cal BP. We recently were awarded a National Science Foundation grant to conduct an extensive dating project in the Lower Pecos. We'll be collecting 50 more uh, samples across seven more sites this next year. When this is a finished, Pecos River style rock art will be the best dated rock art assemblage anywhere in the world. The murals range in size from rather small, such as the White Shaman site that you see here. It spans 24 feet long and 12 feet tall, to quite large, such as the Panther Cave mural, which spans 120 feet long and 22 feet tall. Like Panther Cave, the upper registers really of most of the Pegasus River style murals extend well beyond reach from the shelter floor. Uh, clearly the artists would have needed ladders and scaffolding to produce them. Pegasus River style murals contain elaborately painted polychromatic human-like figures portrayed with varying types of headdresses, body adornment, weaponry, and paraphernalia. Every time I look at this uh, series of photos, I get goosebumps. I just can't even believe I get to study such beautiful art. So vibrant. Some of the figures stand well over 10 feet tall. I think that the tallest figure that we've documented so far is just under 30 feet. They're accompanied by zoomorphic figures, predominantly felines and deer, we also have birds and insects and things like that, but we also have serpents, including horned, and in some cases, horned and feathered serpents. This horned serpent from Mystic Shelter is 20 feet long and dates to around 3,500 years ago. Uh, this will have to be a subject for a future talk. The images, by the way, on the bottom or in different places that you'll see that are unusual color, those are enhanced images using a program called D-Stretch. It just really helps bring out uh, some of the imagery. Anthropomorphs and zoomorphs are accompanied by an assortment of enigmatic figures that aren't human or animal. We refer to these as enigmatic figures. And although we've gone far in identifying um, the recipes for how they actually made them, we don't yet have the complete recipe. What we do know is that the pigments are all inorganic, hematite, limonite, manganese, gypsum, and other earth minerals. And although they had uh, readily available red ochre, for some paintings, it appears that they extracted the iron oxide from yellow siltstone pebbles that are found along the canyon bottoms. They separated the iron rich components from the quartz matrix and then he treated the, that yellow iron rich powder to transform it into a red pigment. This is a very labor intensive process. The inorganic uh, mineral pigments were combined with organic materials to make the paint. What these organic materials are is unclear, but the preliminary studies suggest that it's animal fat, likely deer bone marrow, 
was used as the binder and a likely something like the juice from yucca root or soap root may have been used as an emulsifier. For the past several years, we've been studying how this paint was applied to the wall. Uh, in other words, how were the murals planned and executed? Uh, most important to our understanding is the painting sequence. We use a digital microscope to identify and photographically document paint layer stratigraphy. And the photograph here, you can see me operating the, the microscope and it's connected via USB to the tablet below where we view the image and take the photograph. Uh, on the upper right in your screen, you can see an example of the yellow paint overlying the red. You can see where the red is peeking through. And the same down below is the red pigment over the paint over the top of black. In 2010, I found that the artists of the White Shaman mural followed a very strict painting sequence, applying all the black paint first, followed by red, then yellow, and finally white. You see that sequence along the bottom in the slide. The NEH funds that we received uh, through this project are really fantastic in that they're helping us to go see if this rule govern the production of other Pecos River style murals? Or is this some, was White Shaman just an isolated occurrence or is this something that you find elsewhere? We've completed detailed analysis and digital reconstruction of three murals. And much to our surprise, we found that they follow the same painting sequence, including that 120 foot long Panther Cave mural, as well as an 80 foot long mural at Halo Shelter. And we take hundreds upon hundreds of readings. At Panther Cave, we did over 450 microscopy uh, locations were analyzed across the mural and over 250 at Halo Shelter. We found this to be the case at Fate Bell Shelter as well. And because of the painting sequence, this black, red, yellow, white, figures become literally woven together in the murals. You can readily see this at the Fate Bell mural where figures are both over and other figures simultaneously. This interweaving demonstrates that the murals are painted as single compositions. This was supported by the radiocarbon dating that we did at Halo Shelter where we uh, collected and dated 13 figures across the mural. The dates are super tight with a weighted average of 2004 plus or minus 12 radiocarbon years BP. And I should note that when I first started working in the Lower Pecos, the argument that I was received constantly was that these couldn't be compositions, that they were just a random collection of images painted over hundreds or thousands of years. And we have completely debunked that idea, at least for the murals that we've studied so far. Uh, importantly, this painting sequence, this rule that governed uh, the paint sequence, was in place 5,500 years ago uh, when the artist painted Jaguar Shelter. We've done microscopy at this site as well. And that rule persisted for 3,000 years. So they were using that same rule throughout the production of Pegasus River style paintings. So Pegasus River style artists constructed scaffolding. They worked out complex compositions to communicate detailed narratives. They implemented a paint application order that required significant planning. We know that they used straight edges, stencils, and any number of other tools to ensure that the art was the best that it could be to produce truly exceptional paintings. Paintings that they interacted with, not just visually, but through touch, incising, and rubbing to finally executed figures. So a question that comes to my mind and hopefully to some of yours is why would nomadic foragers invest so much time, labor and effort in the production of art? These were not agriculturalists that were sedentary, they were nomadic moving across the landscape. In Images in the Making, I argue that Lower Pecos artists expended the time, energy and resources because they were engaged in the very serious business of creation. 
Every choice they made reflects reality in which everything, including the art, is animated and powerful. Images were made to exist, literally to live, by the symbolic power of color, by the inherent forces of the raw materials from which the paint was made, and by the order in which the paint was applied to the wall. They were creating living beings, not simply representations of mythological characters. Human and animal forms provided a framework to which the artists packed on visual attributes, such as headdresses of varying types, adornments attached at the wrist or at the elbow, the waist, at the hip, various types of paraphernalia like hat laddles, darts, staffs, and rabbit sticks. These meaning filled and I would argue divine essence filled pictographic elements were used to not only construct a message, but to activate and give life to the narratives portrayed in the art. One of those semantically charged elements is the subject of this evening's lecture, speech breath. This recurring motif is portrayed as a series of dots or lines that emanate out of or into the mouths of humans and animals. My co-author, fine art painter Ashley Busby and I conducted an in-depth analysis of the speech breath motif. We began by querying uh, the Shumla database to locate sites, sites uh, that contain figures with speech breath. We identified 30 sites distributed throughout the region north of the border. Within those 30 sites, we found 90 examples of speech breath. 69 were associated with anthropomorphs and 21 with zoomorphs. We first examined the mark making or artistic process of the motif. We wanted to know as best as we could anyway, the kinds of thoughts, the emotions, the actions the artist engaged in during the image making process. So why do we do this? I think uh, James Elkins, author of What Painting Is, says it best. He writes, paint records the most delicate gesture and the most tense. It tells whether the painter sat or stood or crouched in front of the canvas. Paint is a cast of the painter's movements, a portrait of the painter's body and thoughts. Paintings preserve the memory of the tired bodies that made them, the quick jabs, the exhausted truces, the careful nourishing gestures. Paint is water and stone. It is also liquid thought. The choices made by artists in the production of speech breath reflect the ideas and beliefs through which the people of the Lower Pagos interpreted and interacted with the world. Every mural is first conceived in the mind of the painter, but the physical painting can only begin by selecting a method of application. When beginning the painting process, the painter must choose how they will apply the paint to the canvas, which in this case is the limestone wall. To produce speech breath, artists chose two types of application, casting paint and paint painting directly on the rock panel with a brush tool. Direct contact with the raw wall via a paintbrush, such as you see here on the left-hand side, was um, the dominant way of composing speech breath in Pegos River style. Artists used a paintbrush made with bristles from supple animal hair or coarse plant fibers, depending on the desired shape size and texture of the speech breath. To create splatter paint, artists create, uh, cast paint with energetic movements onto the rock support. Importantly here, density, direction, and path took precedence over the creation of individual marks or shapes. In this example, the artist combined both techniques. We can see the long stream of uh, splatter paint and closer to the mouth, the artist produced dots through a series of quick, really quick jabs. You can almost feel the artist's energy being directed into the image making process.
To understand how they produce the splatter paint, which one would think is quite simple, but it turns out it's not, Ashley did a series of experiments trying to replicate the process. From this, she was able to determine the position of the artist's body when producing the splatter paint, their distance from the wall, the arm and wrist action required to produce it, and a general sense of how challenging it was to produce. We also examined brush strokes, particularly the direction of brush strokes. The speech breath of this feline from Mystic Shelter combines a series of long and short lines. You can see the short ones here and the longer ones here. Our analysis of the brush strokes indicates that the short lines move toward the face of the feline and the long thin lines move in the opposite direction. It denotes both inhalation and exhalation. Just when I think that the artists of the Lower Pecos can't surprise me uh, with another way to convey meaning, they do. Everything about the art carries meaning. The individual elements or symbols, their relationship to one another, the color of the symbols, the order in which the paint was applied to the wall, and the materials used to make the paint, and now the direction of the brush stroke. Nothing about Pecos River style rock art is arbitrary or random. Everything carries meaning. We then recorded choices made by the artist in color, shape, arrangement, action, and interaction of the speech breath attribute. Of the 90 examples, 87 that we documented are red. Even if the figure was painted in black or yellow, the speech breath was red. Three of the examples combined red with either black or yellow. Just recently, really within the, just the past couple of weeks, I've begun finding a pattern in which the artists applied a small amount of paint at the mouth of human and animal figures. You can see it just faintly right here. This is exciting, but white is so translucent in so many cases, it's very hard to see, and I'm afraid that we're often missing it entirely. We found a very interesting pattern in terms of the shape of speech breath. For anthropomorphs and deer, speech uh, breath is almost singularly round, as you see here, and small dots coming here. whereas speech breath for felines is almost singularly formed from lines, either undulating or dashed. And in a few examples, the two shapes are combined to form the speech breath. We recorded whether the artist chose to portray the shapes in a circumscribed pattern or loosely organized in an amorphous arrangement. Here on the left is the amorphous where they're loose, they're, they, they may be all around a figure, whereas the circumscribed stay within a, a general uh, direct line or pattern very tightly constrained. And overwhelmingly, the arrangement for both humans and animals is, is circumscribed. We documented the type of action expressed by the artist during the mark making process. Uh, the 90 examples fell within two categories, either measured, which are care carefully formed, decisive uh, painting episodes, or very forceful, like you see here on the right hand side and, and like we looked at before. Speech breath for anthropomorphs was predominantly measured, whereas for felines, it was most often forceful. The speech breath of anthropomorphs and zoomorphs often interact with each other or with other imagery in the mural, such as you can see here at Cedar Springs with the lines coming up and interacting with this figure that is up above. And here at Rattlesnake Canyon, you can see where the speech breath of two figures intersects.
the artist's choice in paint application technique, their choice in color and shape and arrangement, action and placement within the mural, everything was intentional. And our analysis identified patterns in these choices. These in turn provided us with important clues into not only the function and meaning of the motif, but into how these marks were meant to be visually read and experienced. The patterns that we found mirror cosmological concepts of life and creation in Mesoamerican belief systems. In Mesoamerica, we find extensive use of graphic devices to denote sound and smell, whereas we do have this in, uh, the, in the US, we do have it in rock art. It tends to be more historic period rock art and uh, none certainly as old as what we have in the lower Pecos or down in Mexico. And it's not anywhere as abundant as what you find in the lower Pecos or in Mexico. Here on the wall of Oxtotitlan Cave in Guerrero, Mexico, an artist painted a profile image of a human head and in front of the figure's mouth is a small scroll that represents speech. This painting was produced by the Olmec during the middle formative period between 900 and 100 BC. Uh, prior to the identification of the speech breath motif in the Lower Pagos, uh, this particular one was believed to be one of the oldest or earliest examples uh, denoting speech and breath in the Americas. Mesoamerican cultures and really cultures throughout time and around the world placed enormous significance on breath. Breath expressed in ritualized speech and song uh, was believed to be a powerful force engaged in both creation and maintenance of the cosmos. In the Aztec story of creation, uh, Hecat Quetzalcoatl, the god of wind, blew the wind, sun into motion uh, to initiate time. In the Mixtec story, the creator uh, deity Nine Wind brought life to the world through the force of his breath, spreading wind and rain to the four directions of the cosmos. And among the Maya, the hurricane force wind of their creator de deity Huracan instigated the creation of the cosmos. Creation and time were the result of the primordial sacrifice of breath. Breath was not only intimately associated with creation, but with concepts of the living soul. The Aztec creator deity Omotiot was thought to have breathed a soul of solar origin into the head of an unborn child and at birth ignited a fire soul in its heart. Aztec midwives declared to their newborn children, you were breathed into, you were drilled into. Life was given to a child through the sacrifice of the creator's breath. And this is a very important concept to remember. This soul that was breathed and drilled into the child was not perceived as immaterial, but as matter with weight, form, color, and temperature. It was hot, red, and round. When I spoke with Alfredo Lopez Austin about this, he shared that the soul was graphically portrayed as round red circles. And it suggested that the five circles placed within the red rectangle that you see here in this glyph from uh, Codex Vaticanus represents the soul sent to earth. And that the arrows are metaphors for the fire drills used to ignite the fire or soul in the heart of the child. This life-giving force or soul could be discharged or transmitted to others through speech or song. Speech scrolls and other graphic devices ensured that the fleeting qualities of sound and breath could endure as something tangible and imperishable. Conventions used to denote vocalization and breath in Mesoamerican iconography included the scrolls, dots or lines that emanate from the mouths of humans, such as what you see here. Mesoamerican art also included representations for breath and aromatic fragrances. Breath hovers before the nose or the mouth as a single bead or as a pair of beads. 
the dominant graphic expression used by Pecos River style artists uh, to, pray the, to portray the speech breath was red infilled circles emanating from the open mouths. Artists produced the dots using very decisive measured brush strokes and arranged them within a circumscribed area. The artist's choice in color, red, shape, round, action, measured, and context emanating from the mouth is analogous to Mesoamerican conceptions of the heart soul expressed through measured breathing and ritualized speech or song. In Mesoamerica, breath was the vital connection between humanity and the gods. Humans were obliged to worship the creators through song and prayer to reproduce the primal sacrifice, the gift of breath from the gods to humanity. Fragrant breath was a favorite food of the gods and of the ancestors. It denotes uh, the soul sacrifice in the form of speech and song rising skyward as a spiritually heated offering. In Mesoamerica and in the art of the Lower Pecos, speech or breath emanating from the mouths of figures with sharply upturned heads graphically represent the exhalation of breath and this primal sacrifice. In this image here from Raymond Shelter, you can see the, the mouth open here. He has his head turned straight up. There's even teeth at that location. At Fate Bell, two anthropomorphs stand in profile with their heads turned sharply upward. Other than the interior portion of their bodies, they are mirror images of one another, similarly adorned and wielding sim very similar paraphernalia. They flank a tall, frontally facing anthropomorph that stands about 10 feet tall. The flanking figures have their arms reaching forward as if in supplication to this figure. A stream of red dots pour, pours forth from their mouths onto the two flanking, out of the two flanking figures and coalesce around the U-shaped head of the central anthropomorph. A large ovoid shape intersects with the central anthropomorph's head. This is the distal end of an accoutrement referred to in Pecos River style iconography as a power bundle. Using compositional arrangement, action, and symmetry, the artist directed the viewer's attention to this clear focal point. A repeated theme in Mayan art is the portrayal of a central figure receiving offerings from flanking supplicants. The supplicants could be ancestors, deities, or subordinates. At Monument 65, a late pre-classic sculpture portrays a frontally facing figure flanked by two individuals offering themselves in supplication. The central figure is a world or cosmos creator and sustainer, and the flanking figures are his twin proxies. Their sacrifice constitutes the primordial sacrifice that gave birth to creation and social order and order in the cosmos. Creation required both breath and self-sacrifice. This same visual representation is used today by contemporary Huichol artists to portray ritual supplication. Here, twin figures offer themselves in supplication to Nakawe, who is their creator goddess, goddess that's represented in the central, central part of this image. We propose that the fate bell composition vividly expresses this concept of adoration, supplication, and soul sacrifice. The two flanking figures, virtually identical in posture and physical attributes, represent the ancestral deities or perhaps the twin deity proxies. Their mouths turn sharply upwards, exhale fragrant breath as a heated offering to the central figure. In Mesoamerican thought, powerful animating forces could interact with and be transferred between people and material objects through speech and breath. We see a beautiful example of this at the Rattlesnake Canyon mural. Here, 
a seemingly simple small red anthropomorph expels a long narrow stream of tightly clustered, often overlapping and highly energized red dots. These feed into the body of a taller, more elaborate figure, which in turn releases a gentle stream of precisely painted red dots. This anthropomorph has an atlatl loaded with a dart at its right end, and a stream of red dots flows from the distal end of this dart. In the anthropomorph's opposite hand is a power bundle, which also emits a stream of measured red dots. While Mesoamerican speech squirrels graphically represented the transmission of animating energies, they also served to connect actors in visual narratives. For example, in Codex Selden, the Oracle Lady Ninegrass speaks through the deer headdress of Lord Tenwind which connects to Lady Six Monkey, the protagonist of the story. The line of speech volumes connected the actors in the narrative, indicating interaction between and among characters in the story. Like the artist of the Codex Selden, the artist of the Rattlesnake Canyon mural used the speech breath element, not only to tr transmit those vital energies that you see, through the dots extending from the mouth and out the tip of the dart and out of the power bundle, but to bind figures together in an ever-expanding narrative. The arrangement we just looked at is located in the center of the mural. It's joined by a multitude of figures exhibiting speech breath. We have a serious confab going on here at Rattlesnake Canyon. In addition to the transference of forces between multiple beings and objects, we've identified the exchange of breath or words between two figures facing each other in profile. One of the most striking examples is found at Frost Felines, which you see here. In the codices, speech glyphs between individuals facing one another in profile were used to indicate communication. In this manuscript, two Chichimec pilgrims exchange red hot words in the form of red speech glyphs. However, in most pre-Columbian manuscripts, speech glyphs represented the prayers or songs experienced during the events represented in the pictorial narrative. Speech scrolls linked to Chichimec men inside the origin cave of Chico Mostoc and outside the cave, Chichimec warriors engage in conversation with Toltec holy men. These speech scrolls signaled the presence of sensations that a person would generally only receive by the ear. They were loaded with sound. They carried the voice and the breath of the ancestors engaged in the mythic events portrayed in the visual narratives. Key point here is that that which was seen by the viewers of the manuscript was simultaneously heard. I would argue that the same was and is true of Pecos River style narratives, such as the one at Frost Felines. The red dots are measured words of ritualized speech, soul breath, pregnant with creative energy. And for those who are adept at reading the art and were familiar with its stories, the red dots were loaded with sound. In contrast to the ethereal-like speech breath that we have at Frost Felines, forceful streams of red dots shoot out of the two figures at uh, Rattlesnake Canyon. The two anthropomorphs, both displaying what we call rabbit ear headdresses, stand facing frontally, but with their heads turned in profile toward each other. Their speech breath intersects to create an X shape. The shape of a cross or X in Mesoamerican iconography denoted crossroads and was a very important ritual symbol. Crossroads were places of transformation, transcendence, and creation. In the Maya story of creation, Genesis was brought about through dialogue between creator deities at the crossroads. And in the Aztec creation story, one of them, the original ancestors reproduced themselves by mixing or commingling their breaths and by extension, their words. 
the two anthropomorphs in the Rattlesnake Canyon mural exert highly charged energies through dynamic marks that convey their words and their breath. Perhaps the X shape formed by the intersecting speech represents something like creation at the crossroads. At that point of intersection, the point of contact, their vital forces combine in a creative act. In Mesoamerican art, speech, song, and breath glyphs appear not only with anthropomorphs, but with zoomorphs as well. And this is certainly the case in the Lower Pecos too. At Halo Shelter, a red two-legged feline emits a series of long undulating red lines from its mouth. A long thick red line emerges from its nose before turning downward to intersect the undulating lines below. Houston and Tabby suggest that in classic Maya art, undulating or jagged lines represent powerful rumbling sounds. They offer as an example images of Chak, the rain and lightning god, whose thunderous voice spews forth from the deity's gaping mouth as undulating and zigzag lines. Coming from his nose is an elaborate uh, breath motif. And of course, chalk is associated with the feline. We suggest that these highly energized red lines convey thunderous sounds that reverberated across the mural and into the ears of the onlooker, onlookers. The lines coming out of the feline's nose may represent breath or perhaps blood. Dr. Diana Radio Rolon and I are currently writing a paper on feline symbolism in the Lower Pegasus. Diana has noted similarities between Pegasus River style felines and those of Teotihuacan, most notably the graphic devices emanating from their mouths. These graphic devices have been interpreted as symbols for wind, air, breath, flowing water, words, and blood, all of which are associated with sacrifice and transformation and all related to the creation process. One of the most common ways of denoting breath in Mesoamerica is a single dot placed before the nose or in front of the mouth, such as you see here in this example from the San Bartolo mural in Guatemala. We have something very similar in Pecos River style rock art, such as you can see here, and here at Panther Cave. We suggest this represents the breath soul of the deer. The dart impaling the deer at Camney Shelter and in, the, in, and in front of the dot that's at Panther Cave adds another dimension to the story. In Weechol myth, the sacred deer sacrificed his breath soul so that the sun could be born and the rains would fall. In art and in ritual, the transformation of the deer's soul into the sun is symbolized by piercing the deer's heart, which is peyote, or literally slaying the peyote cactus, which you can see here and here graphically in their yarn paintings. And that leads to a deeper level of interpretation for another Pecos River style motif, the impaled dot you see here. And I will have to save that for another time. Over 5,000 years ago, the artists of the Lower Pagos began using graphic devices to give voice to their, to their ancestral deities. The choices that artists made in the production of the imagery reflect the ideas and beliefs through which they interpreted and interacted with the world. It was a reality in which speech and song were intimately tied to myths of creation and human origins, to the making and maintaining of all things. Color, shape, and context infused these graphic devices with meaning, sound, and life. Pecos River style murals were not passive backdrops painted along rock shelter walls, but rather active mechanisms that spoke or sang through oration, performance, and interaction. Viewers experienced events told through the images as if occurring in the present, 
And for those who were adept at reading the art and were familiar with its stories, speech breath triggered the senses such that what one saw, one also heard, felt, and smelled. For indigenous communities today, the art's not simply a reflection of their past, but it is part of their contemporary lives. Images continue to be animated and empowered. And because of this, ancestral deities continue to provide spiritually heated offerings, soul sacrifices, through images of speech and breath infused with sound and scent. There is so much yet to learn about the art and the people who produced it. I hope that you will join us as we move forward with our work to preserve and read the Lower Pecos manuscripts. And if you'd like to visit the Lower Pecos, I encourage you to join us for a Shumla trek. Uh, you can look up more information about this on the website that you see there, www.shumla.org. Uh, Shumla offers tours to see the rock art um, throughout the year. So thank you very, very much. So I guess I should stop sharing. Uh, you, well, it's up to you. You can leave it up there if okay. you'd like to. And I'll go ahead and go to our, our questions here. Um, <clears throat> uh, amazing talk. You stated everything creates meaning. Returning to your suggestion that the figures are animate, would you also agree with the statement that everything creates a specifically configured living reality? I would, I would. Um, you know, I, it, there's a lot more work that needs to be done on this. And it's something that I'm, I'm very excited about because in January, uh, I'll be going down and spending a couple of weeks with the Huichol in Mexico. And this is one of those questions that I'll be asking them specifically. I wanna know, you know, how their perception their in terms of would they have viewed these images as living? Um, do they consider them still living today? Which I believe from some prior experiences that I've had with the Wichol that they do indeed feel that way. But how far does it go? You know, what, what more can we learn about that? So I'm very much looking forward to that. Okay, I don't know go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. Who would have seen this art? It appears not to have been readily accessible? We have in the Lower Pegasus, some of the murals are what we call public art and some are private. This is a topic that is ripe for research. Some of the murals are very, very uh, remote, very isolated. They're very difficult to access. The shelters are fairly small. Um, others, you're walking down the canyon, uh, down along the waterways and it is in your face. Uh, Fate Bell, for example, has a mural that extends 30 feet in height that when it was vibrant, it would have been like a giant billboard and it was on major, major uh, uh, thoroughfare. So some of the art's very public, some of it is very private. The question about <clears throat> are certain images more or less common at different points in time? Well, that's one of the things that we're looking at through this NSF grant. Um, for example, I'm very curious about, uh, we know for, that speech breath, we've radiocarbon dated speech breath and know that it persisted throughout that 3000 year uh, production of Pecos River style. We have it throughout the entire time frame, but there are specific elements that I'm not so sure about yet. Uh, one in particular dealing with peyotism, which are uh, dots attached to antler tines associated with impaled dots, which you heard me allude to there at the end. Those we've so far dated clustering somewhere around 2000 to 2500 years ago. I don't know if that particular motif and, and the associated um, iconography around it dates back 5,500 years. I, I will be very eager to find that out. So through this NSF grant, what we're doing is targeting specific attributes, specific motifs to see 
when they emerged, uh, how long they persisted, when they may have left the iconography, when new ones came in, how they modified, what, how they changed. Uh, and then we're gonna correlate those to things that are happening in Mesoamerica and in the Americas uh, at that time so that we can see if there's any relationship to what's going on. One, what, how one might have influenced the other. Okay, the next question is, <clears throat> in this talk, speech and breath are used interchangeably. Uh, why don't you make a distinction between the two? Because I, I don't know yet. I can't, I, obviously, anytime you speak, breath is involved. So they are one and the same in that sense. But I don't have the ability yet to be able to say in what cases we're looking at something that is just <clears throat> breath being blown versus words being spoken. I hope that we'll be able to do that as we continue to study. I suspect um, that we'll be able to get to that point, but we're not there yet. I'd, I'd love to be able to differentiate between things like uh, the blowing of breath, the, the speaking of words, the singing of words, or poetry. You know, it, it would be terrific to be able to get down to that level, but I, I don't know. You mentioned the symbolic use of color, but also black, red, yellow, and white mm -hmm. are the colors of the four directions in most indigenous cultures. Uh, can you elaborate on that at all? Oh, absolutely. Um, interestingly, where we first discovered this pattern was the White Shaman Mural. And in my book that I wrote about that mural, uh, uh, the White Shaman Mural, and I, I talk about how this painting sequence is so significant. Black is associated with uh, primordial time. It is associated with uh, femininity, with water, with the underworld, with cold. Red is associated, and it's of course associated with the West. Red is associated with the East, with masculinity, with heat, with fire, um, all of those types of things that are, that are hot, the sun. Yellow is often associated with sunlight, the light of the sun, reflected light, uh, the morning rays of the sun. And then white is associated with uh, transcendence and uh, transformation. So in the murals, when they painted the painting sequence, they began with primordial time, with, with femininity. That's then overlaid with the masculinity, with the red. And the union of fire and water gives birth to the sun, which is associated with the color yellow for the sunlight. So the sun is then born. And then afternoon, as the sun heads towards setting, it we go through the transformation and transcendence, and then the cycle starts again. So I think they were literally painting uh, time and creation into the murals through the painting sequence. Next question is, have you looked to the north for comparative imagery? amongst the ancestral Puebloan cultures? I have, and there are some similarities, certainly, but they're not as much as what I find when I look south. And, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, I think we're gonna find parallels. I think there are some similarities we're gonna find globally. Obviously, things like speech breath, uh, you know, we've got it in the Paleolithic art in Europe, where you've got the dots emanating from the mouth of a feline or lines coming out of the, the mouth of a rhinoceros. So that this concept is a very ancient one. So there's some things that you're going to find globally, right? Um, there are some things that we're going to find that I and I have found that are connected to ancestral Pueblo peoples. But when I look south is where I continue to find just the greatest number of connections. Interestingly, some early uh, DNA studies that were done on uh, remains, human remains from the Lower Pecos, um, all of them 
uh, indicated that they were associated with uh, indigenous Mexico, uh, dealing, you know, going back to uh, the Mexica, to the Mixtec, Nahua, Zapotec, and other groups, Maya too. Uh, those were the ancestral DNA uh, studies that had been done so far. But you're going to find similarities north, you're going to find them south. For me, the bulk of the, the strongest correlations have been south. Are there more and le <clears throat> less anatomically detailed or identifiable anthropomorphs? Why are they so strangely schematic? Why headless? Uh, why no faces? We have them all, we've got all shapes and sizes. We've actually got some with faces. Uh, we have some um, that are headless and in the white shaman mural, the decapitation of the figure that's headless is specific to the narrative. In, the, in that mural in particular, it's where the sun decapitates the moon goddess on the winter solstice. And it actually happens on the winter solstice with sunlight and shadow. Um, so all of these things are, as I say, semantically charged meaning filled attributes that carry meaning and identifiers. Again, I guess I would use an example that we're all familiar with at this time of the year, if you see, or if I was just to describe for you an image of an individual wearing a red uh, suit with a hat and big black boots and a great big bag thrown, thrown across his shoulder and he's great big and he's fat, uh, you immediately know who I'm talking about. Um, if I talk to you about um, a figure, if you're looking at a, an art piece and you see that it's a woman's head and there's snakes coming out of the head and it's a decapitated head, you recognize her as Medusa. You're not Greek necessarily. You weren't around at the time that the Greek myth was first told, but these are visual attributes that you are able to read visually. All of these things, whether they're headless, whether they have a head, whether their head is snouted, U-shaped, uh, antlered, rabbit-eared, uh, whether they are yellow, whether they're black, red, white, what paraphernalia they carry, all of these are part of the graphic vocabulary that the artists used to uh, not only identify, but to enliven the images that they were creating. What differences have you noticed between speech, breath, imagery, between the anthropomorph versus the zoomorph figures? Well, for the anthropomorphs, it is, as I indicated, it is predominantly uh, round dots and it is predominantly very circumscribed where it's you know, more decisive. For the felines, it is much more energetic. The line, they are lines often zigzagged or uh, undulating. They extend great distances. So there's a distinct difference between the two. Now, there are some anthropomorphs that combine both. And these are one of those things that we wanna look at and study further uh, to understand why in some cases you would do it one way versus another way. But when you have two figures side by side and one is portrayed one way with speech breath expressed in one way and the other in another way, it tells you you've got something going on in which the artist is trying to communicate something very, very specific. How fragile are these artworks? Do, do visitors present a threat? I'm sorry? Is it, excuse me for my voice here. Sure. <clears throat> How fragile are these artworks? Do visitors present a threat? Uh, um, the visitors don't present a threat as long as they don't touch the art. I think that is the key. Uh, going and visiting the sites is fine, but you know it's always being very respectful of a site uh, is, is extremely important. Um, you know they're in the open. These are open air sites, so you know they're not deep caves. So photography is fine. It's just um, being careful not to impact the art directly. Um, 
things that I worry about, to be honest, are things like, you know, there's a lot of drilling that goes on in this area. Uh, you know, how would that impact it? You know, they are fragile in the sense that they are continuing to spall. You probably noticed that where, you know, the white areas are where the, the rock shelter is literally falling off. The, they're sloughing off. That's why we're working so hard to get these sites documented as thoroughly as we can, because these are 5,000 year old manuscripts that we're now beginning to learn how to read. Um, so the most important thing we can do is to be careful not to uh, impact them directly and to document them as thoroughly as we can and to try and educate the public as to how significantly important these are uh, to us. And there's a question about uh, <clears throat> anthropomorphs versus zoomorphs again. The anthropomorphs have four fingers and zoomorphs five or more. Can you make that generalization? Oh gosh, you know that's one of my favorite things. And and I when I I just finished the rendering of Panther Cave just recently, and there is no consistency. Um, again, it's so obvious that this is a graphic vocabulary. Uh, I was working on one of the figures just recently that an anthropomorph and the anthropomorph had uh, four fing five fingers on one hand, three fingers on the other hand, and then uh, four fingers on our four toes on each foot. So, you know, totally different. And this is not uncommon. We see this over and over where they use a different number of fingers on one side or another. And interestingly, on a feline at Mystic Shelter, they did the same thing where they, they used, they altered the number of digits on the back feet to the front feet. And it's a, there's a sequence, a feline sequence where you have a feline and then you have another feline and another feline. And they carried and altered this sequence uh, throughout that whole grouping. So no, not five and four, I'm afraid it's not quite that easy. Uh, they are, there is a pattern, but I haven't yet found the pattern. It's just all over the map. Six fingers is not uncommon either. In your interpretation, are projections from the anthropomorphic figures feathers? Are they dancing? I think that they're dancing. Um, and certainly some of the Native American people that I speak to believe that they are indeed dancing uh, and dancing now. You know, it's not just static figures, but uh, I do think, especially at Fake Bell, um, which you might remember was the big winged figure that I pointed out that had the figures around it. And in that case, the direction their feet are facing. Um, literally indicates that they are circling around this beautiful, large central winged figure. So I think in that case, they are portrayed to be dancing as well as actually dancing in the eyes of a Native American person. Uh, a question also, you mentioned that there's similar rock art on the Mexican side. Has anybody done any work on that or anything you can comment on from uh, Very little. Uh, Salve Turpin uh, was there and did work just photographically documenting some of the sites, but not extensively. Nothing systematic has been done. Uh, we now have um, an opportunity. We've been provided with a tremendous amount of data on uh, work done by an amateur, uh, actually he's a spelunker, uh, that spent a lot of time in Mexico and went to dozens and dozens of sites in Mexico. And he's provided all of us detailed records of everything that um, he did while he was there. Uh, Dr. Uh, Radio Rolón that I mentioned earlier is now the um, archeology, span uh, she works for Shumla as a senior preservation archeologist. And she is going to, she's a native uh, of Mexico. She is going to work to set up a rock art documentation project in Coahuila, Mexico. And I'm very excited about this because right now we're working with just part of the story. Uh, like I said earlier, I think that there are hundreds of murals south of the border and 
we know from the photographs that we have seen that it's clearly Pegasus River style, but we need to look to see, um, you know, what's different, what's the same, and to get it documented and preserved. Okay, thank you. I think that we've covered the the questions here. Unless you have any parting comments that you'd like to portray. No, I, th I think that's it. I'll stop sharing there. Um, I hope everyone enjoyed it. And um, please, you know, if you again, if you'd like to see the art, uh, do consider joining a Shumla Trek and. Uh, if there's any questions that I can answer afterwards, feel free to send me a message. Well, thank you very much. Like I, I told you before, this is the first time I can recall in all my years with the Society of having somebody talk to us about rock art. So I hope that we're able to find additional speakers. And as you learn more, maybe you can come back and talk to us again in the future. But uh, I really appreciate your, your speech tonight. Absolutely. Thank you so much again for having me. Sure. Just a final comment for those on the on the call. On January 6th, we will be having our next lecture, and Dr. Clark Wernicke will be speaking on the peopling of the Americas and the Galt site in Texas. So please join us on January 6th for that. There'll be a, a link and more information up shortly on our website, which again is www.pcswdc.org. With that, I uh, wish everybody a good evening.